Hey gang, we're back again. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about an older story. We're going to talk about uh, The White People by, by Arthur Macon. Why is the, the this story considered part of the weird? Why are we including it in part of the weird? Well, the real reason is, is because Lovecraft wrote a lot about the books that influenced him. He wrote a lot about about authors and stories that really um, he found intriguing and wanted to build upon their ideas. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Arjunan Blackwood, Ambrose Bierce, um, Robert Chambers, who wrote uh, The King in Yellow. These are all stories that were written before him that he felt were were verging on something that were that, that were talking about a new type of horror story that he thought he found very intriguing, and so we're including um, Arthur Macon, the White People, because it is one of the stories that influenced uh, Lovecraft to create the weird genre, and has since then it's considered part of the weird genre itself. It's considered an earlier adaptation of what we call the weird. This idea of this of this larger world that we know that we that we know about about this cosmic alienage about this existential horror again the idea of both empowerment and at the same time dread and, and we're going to look at it through those eyes we're going to look at the eyes of the weird excellent um i i'm i'm really excited about this story um it has a frame it has a prologue and an epilogue in which we meet this character ambrose and ambrose is our person who knows. Modern people, or modern materialists, as Ambrose puts it, live in a form of denial. We, uh, we really we really don't understand the forces of our universe and the, the, real, the real nature of experience because we are, again, okay, engaging in a kind of ignorance. And it, for lack of a better term, Ambrose uses the term materialism. And the, the question is that Ambrose toys with in the prologue and comes back to in the epilogue is, what is the nature of true evil? And true, true evil, okay, is where we, we adopt the rules, they adopt the rules of a more powerful paradigm than our ignorance allows when we transgress when we cross over from the world of ignorance into the world of knowledge of really how our universe works we cross into an empowerment model and the only way we can do that according to ambrose is innocently unconsciously in other words true evil is empowerment. It's transgressive in that we emerge out of our ignorance into the true rules that operate in our universe. And in a way, it, we experience that as crossing a threshold, crossing from one world to another. But in many ways, the world that our ignorance protects us from is, in a way, our own. The calling we don't want to hear is our destiny. And it's interesting that he, he's basically playing around with the, and you can agree or disagree with me with Peter, but the Garden of Eden story to some extent. He's talking about the original sin. He's talking about a, 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 a two innocent people in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, taking a bite out of that apple, taking a bite out of the, 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 the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it's an Adam and Eve story. And it's a Gnostic Adam and Eve story, a Gnostic Adam and Eve story. That's G-N-O-S-T-I-C, Gnostic as in Gnosis or Gnosticism, is where we actually side with the serpent. And this Adam and Eve and Garden of Eden and serpentine model actually privileges the serpent. It's the creator who wants to keep us ignorant who is the enemy. It's the serpent who helps us discover our own divinity and our own godhood. It's an empowerment model, but it's also transgressive. And so he 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 gives forward again. Ambrose is such an interesting character, such an odd little character. You you, you have the feeling he was based off a character, somebody that 
that um, Arthur Macon probably met in his lifetime or something like that, or it, or an al amalgam of, of various strange characters who had these weird philosophical ideas. But um, he gives us this idea of a green book, which is a, it's a diary, it's a journal. It's a narrative by a young girl uh, from, from a, um, from a, Upper, not necessarily upper class, but upper middle class, maybe a professional class family, enough that the family uh, uh, has a nurse who looks after the girl, and this nurse we find out through this through this through this narrative of the Green Book has that knowledge, has that that gnosis that Peter's talking about, the ability to invoke power, uh, to make make herself her own god in a sense. Yeah, the, the 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 prologue and epilogue, okay, um, frame a journal, a diary uh, that this girl kept. She's do she's uh she's about sixteen years old as of where the diary, aka the Green Book, breaks off, and she's recounting her experiences as a young girl. And all the things her nurse taught her, and then recounts at the age of 14, her retracing the path, retracing the journey that her nurse took her on, not just figuratively speaking, but actually into the dark places, okay, the wild places of the forest around which uh, she lived, okay? And in, um, and in this return journey at the age of 14, I believe, um, Thir she, uh, 13, almost 14, I think is what she says. Right. She discovers that everything her nurse said was true, but with this new dimension. She discovers in many ways, for instance, the clay creature that her nurse taught her how to make. She can make a better clay doll than her nurse can. In other words, there is something unexpectedly empowering it's an unexpected discovery of who she really is that was not even fully intimated by the instructions of her nurse and we see some links to lovecraft here we see the idea uh, in this case of an actual other universe lovecraft usually talks about a non-euclidean uh, uh cosmic type universe and and, and macon presents us with an actual real un another universe another alternate earth so to speak where, where where this this thing takes place we're again countered with an, an idol a, a a a fetish a symbol uh, uh in this case of the of the clay of the clay doll which uh, again reminds us of the the two statues of cthulhu and the call of cthulhu so again we can see where where, where where lovecraft is pulling some of his ideas from some of his things but again Macon is, is unique he's different than lovecraft he's saying something a little bit different in many ways um uh the uh the green book girl story okay is less ambitious cosmically we don't have a sense of the deep ones or the outer ones or the old ones we don't have the fish people okay we don't have that older alien civilization we're talking about a deeper truth here on earth and um and again this return journey her, we don't know what happened to the nurse as of as of the age of 14, the nurse is no longer in her life. But as a young girl, the Green Book girl, that's how I refer to her, uh, retraces her path. But in many ways, this retracing of the path deep into the woods around where she lives with her father. OK, no mother, by this, by the way. But her retracing of that journey is metaphysical. It's happening in her mind as much as it's happening in real life. And I'm reading from page 140 in our in our Penguin book. And I pretended, she said, I was following the brook all over again that the nurse had shown her. I went all the way in my mind. And at last I found the woods and crept into it under the bushes. And then in the dusk, I saw something that made me feel as if I were filled with fire. As if I wanted to dance and sing. A new dimension that her nurse had not acquainted her with. As if I wanted to dance and sing and fly up into the air because I was changed and wonderful. 
uh, the this this experience is frightening to her uh, as she recounts in her diary looking back a couple of years on this return journey to the forest this return journey which is so empowering that empowerment is frightening to her because she also remembers the story that her nurse told us about lady avalon and lady avalon okay was a witch and she was punished uh, for her witchery and she is afraid of that again I was frightened she says on page 140 I thought I was to be burned law. she realizes that there's a price to be paid for her empowerment it's very interesting again it is it is a little bit different than, than what we see um, with Lovecraft Lovecraft presents us with with fish people, and with this story, we're presented with nymphs, creatures of great beauty. Uh, yes, they are meant to be fairies, but fairies more in the sense that, well, talk in the way that Tolkien, J-A-R-J-R-R, Tolkien would approve. Uh, Tolkien did not think of leprechauns and little people, okay? His elves, his fairies uh could look like you or me but they were different somehow they were more pure in what sense they belong more fundamentally to the earth what what tolkien called the middle earth they the elves the fairy belong to the earth in a way that we don't or we don't feel we do because as ambrose puts it we're hopeless materialists we see everything in such a way that we're not participating directly into the real dynamics of our world, the actual rules. But again, I'm, I'm on page 141. We're talking about that return journey in the forest. Okay. And she said, I felt so strange at the top of 142, wondering and doubting and feeling quite sure at one time and making up my mind. And then I would feel quite sure that such things couldn't happen. Really? And it began all over again. But I took great care not to do certain things that might actually be very dangerous. So I waited and wondered for a long time, and I was not sure at all. And I never dared to try to find out. But one day I became sure that all the nurse said was true, quite true. And I was all alone when I found it out. I trembled with joy, all over with joy and terror. And as fast as I could, I ran into one of the old breaks old groves where we used to go and it was there where the nurse had made the little clay man i ran into it and i covered up my face with my hands and lay down and i stayed there for hours without moving whispering to myself delicious terrible things and saying some of the words over and over i got cold i got i got hot i got cold and the air seemed full of scents and flowers and singing and i wanted to make a little clay man but I could, I could make something that was much better than what the nurse made, a likeness that was far better. In other words, the nurse did not fully understand the import and significance of the secrets she was sharing with this child, the Green Book Girl, the writer of this journal. She didn't realize, the nurse did, apparently did not realize that this girl is answering a calling and is going through a door that the nurse does not herself fully understand. At the at the end, in our epilogue, we see Ambrose, we see Ambrose speaking of how the girl metaphorically, so to speak, poisoned herself. She didn't understand the full significance of the powers that she was assuming the powers that were filling her, the powers that she was taking advantage of, she didn't realize they could also be deadly and that they could harm her. And he speaks of the way the Green Book girl accidentally poisoned herself. Ambrose returns to where the Green Book girl was found dead as a teenager, approximately approximately 16 years old and discovers an idol a very old idol going back to the roman period and he destroys that idol he doesn't want another girl to follow that path 
And that's the story. Um, again, it is an earlier um, attempt. Uh, at, 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 it's, it's a earlier foray into the weird. Um, it's not quite, again, the as Peter said, it's not the cosmic horror at this point. It is the other world. There is alienage to it, but it's an old alienage. It's 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 more akin to again what we've got in Call of Cthulhu, that mythological horror, that that horror of the fact that the the creatures and and the goblins and 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 the the fae of ancient stories are real, and that they they offer us a world outside of our own material world, which must be guarded against. Um, and it's interesting because again. I think to some extent what Arthur Macon's saying about the weird is it's something to be guarded against. It's something that we that society needs to 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 put down and to to remove all knowledge of, uh, lest people be tempted to to be like the green girl and empower themselves with this terrible power. And it, it's uh, interesting. Uh, no, I, I was just going to interrupt with a thought that you gave me. Okay, this is this is something you laid out to me very carefully, and I think it's so true. Okay, in, in the case of Mencken, we really are talking about 19th century English imperialism and colonialism. The English Empire, okay, is at its apex. It, it's the entire world. In a sense, we're talking about the ultimate patriarchy of white masculinity. It has never been more powerful in the world. And what is the threat to it? Foreign peoples. But the ultimate foreign people, the gypsy that concerns us most, says often Macon, is a woman. A woman is that unconscious creature, that innocent creature who does not understand the powers she is instinctively and intuitively drawn towards power she is drawn to embody and practice and it's up to the patriarchy to make sure make sure okay that ignorance remember ambrose decries that ignorance okay he says that our our materialism as modern people is a form of ignorance it's a form of foolishness but it's necessary ultimately in ambrose's view to what as you pointed out to me, to protect us from, okay, the foreign person, okay, in our midst, to protect us from the woman who innocently, innocently dabbles in power she doesn't understand, which is another way of talking about evil, according to Ambrose. Now, you've also said that, uh, that Lovecraft goes further okay he doesn't just speak of cosmic abysses okay and cosmic horror in multiverse but he actually says there's am i understanding this correct he's saying there's no way to protect us anymore i, okay? I think that's one of the things he's saying yes he's saying the the inevitability that this will happen is upon us it's already happened we're just not aware of the fact it has and where are we going? There's a third step here. Where are we going with Black God's Kiss and Black God's Shadow and C.L. Moore? We're beginning to see the embrace of that. And that's going to be part of the new weird, the embracing of that empowerment, the embracing of the transgression. We see a complete reversal from Macon. We're Macon saying, oh, the patriarchy must, must stop that. You see writers talking about what if the characters instead take that up and destroy the patriarchy? What if they instead grab that power themselves and reverse the way the use the universe is, is put together? What if the Green Book girl's journal had not broken off and she could finish telling her story of empowerment? And that's what we'll pick up uh, next time when we start talking about CL more. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.